Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and this is Cutting Through the Matrix on February the 6th, 2009. Newcomers, I always suggest you go into cuttingthroughmatrix.com and on the website you'll find lots of previous talks I've given where I show you lots of history which, once you tie it together, proves that we don't stumble down through time or guided along certain paths and predicted paths, basically planned paths so that the world will come, end up in the place it's supposed to, according to the planners. And it's done with the coordination of the media, of course, in all ages. And we have been run this way for an awful long time by a very small group of people, really very, very wealthy people, who employ lots of academics to do the, the thinking for them and do the strategy for them as well. It's planned with military precision into a system it's not quite communist, but as, Karl, as Lenin said himself, it's not quite communist and not quite capitalist. It's a new type of socialism. It's an organized society where everyone lives according to nature, but we'll have high priests of nature who will tell us who should be born and who will not be born according to your value to life, to the system. Also, look into Alan Watts Sentinel.eu for transcripts, which you can download off these talks I've given and print them up, and they're written in the various languages of Europe. For those who want to buy my books or donate, you can find out how. Just go to cuttingthroughmatrix.com website, and it's all there. And you do keep me going. You bring me to you. The listeners bring me to you. So I don't ask for a payment from anyone. I don't ask advertisers to, to back me. If I did, I'd have to bring them on the show, and then you'd hear a lot of advertising going on in the guise of, a, of, of a, a format of the show. And because things are so serious now, so serious indeed, at the speed of this brave new world scenario that's coming up, we, we really don't have time to even think about personal gain whatsoever. None of us do. Even if we could, we, we can't, because it's coming like a roller coaster. And as I say, I, I said earlier, Lenin talked about the communist system, the, the dictatorship supposedly of the proletariat and he said it only lasts about 70 years and that it would emerge and blend with the West not quite capitalist not quite communist this is a system we're going into now it's a world run by experts that's what it's about as Bertrand Russell said a world run by experts, in fact Russell said we shall train the public until they can't do anything without the advice of an expert. That's happened. That phase has happened because we've had 50 to 60 years of propaganda from experts of all kinds, often nonsensical. And the reason it's nonsensical is, is the, the content was irrelevant. It was to get you used to being told what to do by experts as a conditioning process. You know, the United Nations was set up as a private corporation it still is a private corporation. It's not a democratic institute by any imaginable means possible. It was set up as a front organization by the people I've been talking about for the last few weeks that at least openly came out as a group back in the late 1800s under the Cecil Rhodes group, merging with the Round Table Societies and Lord Milner's group and became the Royal Institute for International Affairs, or is better known in the West as the Council on Foreign Relations. And their history is astonishing to find out that they have think tanks dealing with every social aspect of the world. Everything that you need for survival, they have under their, their, their thumbs, basically. They're, they're on to it. We'll be back on the more of this topic after this break. I'm Alan Watt, and this is Cutting Through the Matrix. We're really going through the histories of a group who planned to make the British system the microcosm of a global system by, first of all, setting off wars across the world, having conflict, and out of the conflicts, they'd have treaties signed that they hoped eventually bring about amalgamation of various groups of nations. 
they were for a world war, the first world war. And actually many of the members talked about the need for a second world war once that had finished because the public were not ready to give up their sovereignty. Professor Carl Quigley himself in Tragedy and Hope and the Anglo-American establishment admits to much of this. So they fought, or they really they set up both sides of every conflict in a Galian manner to bring out a grand plan, a grand plan that's manifesting. Today it was through the whole 20th century. In fact, it was this particular group that really advocated the beginning of the Vietnam War. And it was the same group that eventually that started the howling to get us out of the Vietnam War because it served its purpose and helped to amalgamate a country, Vietnam, made up of many different warring tribes into a unified country of supposed democracy by invading them. If they hadn't been invaded, it could have taken another 50 to 100 years before they'd amalgamate by propaganda and other ways of interference. That's how the game is played. It's like an incredible chess board, and the world is seen as a chess board by these people. You have to go into their members. It's astonishing who these people really are at the top, and even the ones that I say emerged for the first time, not publicly, I should say, because they've been here for a long time before their first public emerg- uh, emergence. And Milner, who was one of them, is an, has an incredible career, how he just managed to get into all the right positions in governments. He was put in charge of the British War Cabinet. He's a private, a guy with a private organization that had already started the Boer War privately in South Africa, who was put in charge of the British War Cabinet, and his group were all for a world war to bring about world government and the creation of the League of Nations, which became the United Nations. It's fascinating, too, to see that this man set up far-ranging strategies because everyone's held, heard of the Balfour Declaration put out in Britain. It was actually a letter on behalf, supposedly, of the British Parliament from Mr. Balfour, Arthur Balfour, that the British government was all for setting up a Jewish state in Palestine. And yet, going into the memoirs of the Royal Institute for International Affairs and the different biographies on Mr. Milner, it was Milner who drafted up the Balfour Declaration and gave it to Balfour to read. That's how they do it. That's a long-term strategy. And, of course, I've mentioned before how Sir Storrs, S-T-O-R-R-S, who was the the, the, basically the overseer of Palestine for Britain. He had the powers of a king while he was the overseer during the 20s up to the 30s. Uh, he himself uh, talked about setting up an Ulster. We've set up an Ulster, he said, in the Middle East. Ulster was set up in Ireland as, a, as basically a foreign entity within Ireland on the behalf of London. Long-term planning, absolutely incredible. And it's also amazing, too, that Milner, who set up all of that, got married to a very, very famous woman from a long lineage. Uh, But he had one child out of wedlock, who, again, was given all the helping hands to go through the usual military academies of Britain, but he had deserted eventually, changed his name to Israel, and went to live in Palestine. He married an actress uh, in the new new Palestine or Israel so these guys who, and they were all bankers by the way Milner was an incredible banker they had their own banks this group Rothschild was one of the main characters who ran the money system they had J.P. Morgan and many others and they had lots of foundations they set foundation after foundation up they're still running today and they have many front organizations and front foundations to which, through which they funnel the money because they have a planned society coming into view. Now remember this group that created the Royal Institute for International Affairs based themselves in Chatham House in London. Chatham House became the head of the OSS during World War II. Why? Because 
they already had a massive spy system and secretive organization set up. They simply gave the name OSS to a new branch of it. The OSS, at the end of World War II, became the CIA in the United States and MI6 in England. And Chatham House still goes on today, and it's still spawning off massive groups that are pressure groups that lobby governments with unlimited financing along the course of, that we're on today, sustainable development and so on, the greening projects. One of their biggest group is pushing for the total, the, not just the emergence, we have already have Europe completely combined under a, a parliamentary system, one parliamentary system. But they want to completely integrate all of the systems to sustainable development through all of those countries, again, mainly through schooling and so on, and picking future leaders. They train future leaders. I'm talking about the Common Purpose Coalition. That's one of the front groups who use the same techniques as Chatham House because that's who runs them. They call themselves a charitable group, by the way. And they pick children at school. The teachers who belong to that group pick, pick children in school and they pick the right ones, of course, and they train them to be future leaders who will then rise above everyone else. You can guarantee it because we're well funded into the right positions. See, there's no democracy involved here. It's all a complete sham. We've never had democracy. And the CFR, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, have their men spread out through every country on the planet in positions of politics and the bureaucracies, the federal civil servants. As I say, they set up the United Nations to bring all this about as a front organization, as a private organization, the United Nations. They have their own schools for the children of the bureaucrats who tend to intermarry there. And the children are taught not to, be de- to, be, to believe in democracy. They're taught to rule, to rule over people. This article ties in with it, though, because... It's from the BBC, 2nd of February, 2009. You're used to seeing these these articles appear now because they're on a a roll, as I say, to sustainable development and bringing down the population. Selfish adults damage childhood from the BBC. By Mark Easton. The aggressive pursuit of personal success by adults is now the greatest threat to British children, a major independent report on childhood says. It calls for a sea change in social attitudes and policies to counter the damage done to children by society. The family breakup and principled advertising, too much competition in education and income inequality are mentioned as big contributing factors. A panel of, here's a word here, you don't even need to know who they are, a panel of independent experts, as soon as we hear that word we think, oh my God, the holy ones, you know. Experts carried out the study over three years The report called The Good Childhood Inquiry, sounds wonderful, and commissioned by the Children's Society, Children's Society, yeah, it sounds wonderful too, don't you, concludes that children's lives in Britain have become more difficult than in the past, adding that more young people are anxious and troubled. Well, no kidding. wonder why. They're getting fed mercury through all their soft drinks and and their, their packaged foods. They've had more inoculations than anyone else on the planet or any previous generation. They've been bombarded with video games and so on, brought up in a nihilistic society, given nihilistic music, and remember, two up into the culture industry that's all run by these same group of people. According to the panel, the excessive, now here it is, here's a term here, it's a, a, a study, more and more of this, excessive individualism is to blame for many of the problems children face and needs to be replaced by a value system where people seek satisfaction more from helping others than serving again, you see. That's from the Royal Institute for International Affairs, CFR. Rather than pursuing private advantage. Quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, See, all media is propaganda. And remember, too, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, its, its members own the media. It owns the BBC. By the way, there's about 100 members of Common Purpose work in the BBC. But 
does that one article, and it ties right into it with the next article here. It says here, it's from, I think this is from World Net uh, Daily, February the 5th, 2009. A United Nations human rights treaty that could prohibit children from being spanked or homeschooled uh, ban youngsters from facing the death penalty and forbid parents from de- deciding their family's religion is on America's doorstep. A legal is a word again. A breathe a sigh of relief. Expert <gasps> warns. You see, an expert. Michael Farris of Percival, Virginia, is president of ParentalRights.org, chairman of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, and chancellor of Patrick Henry College. He told WND or WND, yeah, it's WND, that under the UN Conserva- or Convention on the Rights of the Child, now that was done years ago, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, everybody thought, how wonderful the children who should have rights. Then you find out the parents had no rights at all once it was signed. That's how they do it. Anyway, I'm going to continue with this and show you where it's all going after the following break. I'm Alan Watt, and this is Cutting Through the Matrix, discussing this uh, wonderful treaty that was drafted up to give children's rights, and surely be called the No Rights for Parents Mandate, I suppose, or Manifesto, the like manifestos. And it's from World Net Daily, it says here, uh, they're talking about... uh, there's even a homeschool legal defense association in Patrick Henry College. He told World Net Daily that under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, every decision a parent makes can be reviewed by the government to determine whether it's in the child's best interest. And that's exactly what they wanted. And by the way, that's what the Milner Group that became Roger of International Affairs wanted. Remember, remember what Carol Quigley said about this group. He said, this group acts in the way that the right wing thinks that the communists do. It's an ultra-socialist type world to be run by a small elite who've decided they're the fittest of all in the eugenics league. They have the right to decide how the world is to be run. So it says here, it's definitely on our doorstep, you said, this is back to World Net Daily. He, the left wants to make the Obama-Clinton era permanent Treaties are a way to make it as permanent as stuff gets. It's very difficult to extract yourself from a treaty once you begin it, and that's a fact. You should never sign any treaties at all. You can't compromise in life. You can't even start to compromise. If you can put, it, put all of their left-wing socialist policies into treaty form, it's not left-wing. It's, 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 it's a relationship for international affairs in the CFR, who seem to be very communistic in the way they deal accordingly quickly, right? He says, then we're stuck with it, even if they lose the next election. It's nothing to do. It doesn't matter who you get in, because, as quickly said, too, we always put our members in at the top of all parties. That's in Tragedy and Hope and the Anglo-American establishment. But he talks about the parallel government. The 1990s era document was ratified quickly by 193 nations worldwide, but not the United States or Somalia. Somalia... There was then no recognized government to do the formal recognition, and in the United States has been opposition to its power. Countries that ratify the treaty are bound to it by international law. Although signed by Madeleine Albright, a fascinating uh, lineage she's got, U.S. ambassador to the U.N. on February 16, 1995, the U.S. Senate never ratified the treaty largely because of conservatives' efforts to point out it would create that list of rights which primarily would be enforced against parents. Because that's the truth of it, being forced against parents' wills and wishes. And it's interesting now that Hillary Clinton stated openly a few years ago that if she ever gets in, that she, she would end homeschoolers. There would be no homeschoolers. See how things are all set up way ahead in advance. And they always put the right people in at the top, as quickly said. All belong, belong to the same group. That's fascinating. Madeleine Albright, though, she's the same woman who said on television, without a blink, that uh, when she was told that all the people were starving in Iraq during the first Gulf, after the, Gulf, the first Gulf War because of the embargo that the United Nations put on them, that loving, caring group, 
They were starving them to death. That's used as a tactic of warfare, you see. And she was told that half a million at that time had died, women, children, men, because they couldn't get food or medicine. She was asked if she thought that was acceptable, and she says it's quite acceptable, without a blink. That's the sort of monster we're dealing with here. There's lots of these monsters at the top, believe you me. And they're bearing their teeth now. It's an article that fills it, fits right in again. It's a joke, this article, too. It's a real joke. But again, that's how the media feeds it to us. They treat us like stupid fools all the time. That's their job. But they're not giving us trivia. And this is from The Telegraph. It's on children's health. It says, Too much television and time spent on the Internet can make children mentally ill. An in-depth report has concluded... This was on the 2nd of February, 2009. Excessive exposure makes a child materialistic, right? Makes them materialistic, which in turn affects their relationship with their parents and their health. This is one of the conclusions of a new wide-ranging survey into British childhood produced for the Children's Society. I just mentioned that. It says that children are part of a new form of consumerism with under 16-year-olds spending $3 billion Pounds of their own money each year on clothes, snacks, music, video games, and magazines. The report claims that some advertisers explicitly exploit the mechanism of peer pressure while painting parents as buffoons, and it is the most extreme form advertising persuades children that you are what you own. Well, no kidding. They've just noticed this. I've gone through Bernays and his whole techniques, remember. Bernays helped set up and do the propaganda for the League of Nations that was a precursor for the United Nations did a hand in the latter too and he thought the people the public of the world were fools because he could manipulate their minds and make them do anything he wanted them to do and it's the same bunch that are running the world today as I say they created the culture of America went through the whole history of that this is in addition the constant exposure to celebrities through TV, soaps, dramas and chat shows is having a detrimental effect. Hey, look at the parents. They've been watching them their whole lives too. Look at them. Look where their headspace is. The TV is the greatest weapon ever, ever created. It says children today know an intimate detail and in, in detail the lives of celebrities who are richer than they will ever be and mostly better looking. This exposure inevitably raises aspirations and reduces self-esteem. No kidding. No kidding. Bye, we're always learning here, eh? I'll be back with more after this break. You're listening to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Because you can handle the truth. Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and this is Cutting Through the Matrix. And we're cutting through a lot of nonsense here as well. I was going to call it something else, but I won't. Because I, I have to laugh at these studies that come out and give us such amazing conclusions that we'd never have thought about ourselves. Astonishing, isn't it? So here's this big study going into children's mental health primarily. And I've just noticed that the media and advertising have been exploiting children. I've just noticed that. Even though Bernays was doing it back in the 1920s, right through the 50s and 60s and, and beyond, in fact, until he died, a very old man, he and his kind. And, the group, and it wasn't just to sell products, believe you me, it was to alter the culture. They created the culture of consumerism, in fact. But they also targeted the children. Remember, one of the prime objectives for this new world order was to segregate the generations until they could hardly even converse with any other generation. They'd be stuck in their own. That way they're easier, easier to manipulate. And you can re-indoctrinate them with an, a new doctrine so that they, they won't get contaminated with their parents' doctrine. That was all part of the strategy that's been used up until now. In fact, they're going really at it now with the children in the school because from the age of kindergarten onwards, they're getting incredible scientific indoctrination into greening and serving the world state and so on. 
exactly as Bertrand Russell said they'd do. But getting back to this article from the Telegraph, it says here, the report has found that only a quarter of children with mental health problems get any specialist help. And listen to this, one in ten, one in ten, five to six year olds now has mental health issues. One in ten. Five to sixteen year olds. Well, we've seen what happened with autism and all the different categories of autism. Believe you me, attention deficit and all the rest of it, and then the hypercho- these are all just categories of the same problem, and they all get that from their early inoculations. And never mind all the mercury they're taking in and all the soft drinks and so on. But only now they're released after 50 years of studying it. <laughs> so it's ranging from anxiety and or depression to conduct disorders such as destructive behavior. No kidding. All they've watched on TV is, is guys with guns. Uh, generally the good guys these days, these were the bad guys that wore the hoods. Now it's the good guys who wear the hoods, smashing down doors and all that. And, and using video games where you just kill everything that's in your path. Designed for the military to make them become desensitized to killing. But I've just found this out. <laughs> anyway, it claims that the upward trends of, trend of violence in the media in general is making children violent and causing tension within the family. I wonder why. The report says we know from controlled studies that exposure to violence can breed violence. No kidding. That's exactly what, what we were saying years ago, just with the video games alone. So it seems likely that the upward trend in media violence is helping to produce the upward trend in violent behavior and also the growth of psychological conflict in family relationships. Now here's a real, here's where it really goes to, you see. You don't understand this, how they do it. The report also notes that commercial pressures have led to the premature sexualization of young people. I guess that's like the Spice Girls and all that aiming at 8 to 12 year olds. They just noticed that as well. I know young people are having sex earlier because of many forces, including more privacy when both parents work, more contraception, commercial pressures towards premature sexualization, and fundamental changes in attitudes. Well, again, go back to Bertrand Russell's books when he was talking about his private schools. He was encouraging this kind of stuff back in the 1920s as a test for the rest of the world. This bunch here is finding this out now, supposedly. The report recommends, and here's a recommendation after the all this mental illness and everything else, it recommends that sex and relationships and understanding of the media should be a compulsory part of the personal, social, and health curriculum. So more sex education. You know, children today at school must go through the whole Kama Sutra. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. They could shock their parents with what they're taught in school. So the answer is more sex education. And I guarantee you, this, what will come out of this will be a new way of learning how to have different kinds of relationships because they don't want personal bonding, you see. That's what it's about, really. That's the reality behind it. Then personalization of sexual contact. You don't have bonding. You don't have groups. You don't have family. And then government will eventually be the master over every single person. Just like George Orwell said it would be. That was the one thing standing in its way where people who bonded leads to families. The families stand up for each other. Then you've got more families in the community. They tend to all stand up for each other, as they used to do when they had families. And the government had a problem. And you could not have a totalitarian regime where you could guide the whole world and tell them what to do, but you've got families in the way. It doesn't work that way. So there's been a war on families for an awful long time. Now, going into this month, this, this month or the next month too, where they have this big campaign on to get the public to accept the fact we've got to start being sterilized and neutered and stop having children. We're not dying fast enough, even though they've done their best covertly for the last 50 years through the food, the, the phthalates, the sterilizers, the bisphenol A's that they put in the food, the melanin they put in the food and all the injections they gave us as well. Then going to Arthur Kessler, who worked for MI6, by the way, and that's out now as well, to write all these novels to get us all thinking in a certain way. And he, he himself said that he worked with a think tank with the United Nations to find ways of lobotomizing that part of the brain that gave you your, your, 
your, your self-preservation abilities, preservation. You wouldn't need it, you said, because the state would be making all the decisions for you. We'll be under war, total warfare attack, and people didn't know it. But they can't tell the children. We're the children. After all, if they asked us all to go forward and get neutered, would they have many volunteers? So they, they had this big problem. How do you bring the, 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 the world down to a manageable world population? Well, you have to do it without the consent of the people, obviously. It's warfare. Warfare. And this group, again, that have caused most wars, real wars in the 20th century, also led the cultural wars. And now they're on a roll for the next part of depopulation to fit their targets. After all, you've made a long-term business plan. You've got to make sure your objectives are reached on time. They will not deviate from their, their terms of their plan. Everybody that I've mentioned over the last few months worked and worked when they were alive and the rest of and many alive today who still do it for the Royal Institute for International Affairs combined with MI6 combined with the CIA combined with the culture industry combined with academia people don't realize that, that the CIA and CSIS in Canada and MI6 have lots of professors that work for them as well through all the big academia uh, universities on the planet academia and you can also have people too throughout society that work on a contract basis with them. They don't work full time. It's not like the movies. And they make sure that culture is guided along the right paths. They run the media. They run the magazines. They run the scientific journals, etc. But they want the world brought down to a manageable society, a manageable level. And they are the ones who are also promoting what they call transhumanism. What is transhumanism? Basically, their goal is to create a society, two, really two societies. One will be the elite who will be basically, barring, bar, barring any accidents, technically immortal. But they'll retain all of their mental faculties. They must be wild animals, as Galton Darwin said, Charles Galton Darwin. Because they they are steering planet Earth along a predetermined path. The other ones will be basically golem. A golem is a man-made slave. That's where they'll be more perfected. They won't need sleep. They won't need entertainment. They won't need to consume much. They won't need rewards. They'll be very, very efficient. They'll be the Borg, in other words. Back to population control. This again is from Lord Bertrand Russell, one of the guys who helped set up communism in China. He was taught at university. He was sent over there to teach communism in universities before they had the revolution. And he also was a member of the Royal Institute for International Affairs. We were busy all over the planet. They were also busy in other countries, Japan as well, with the, with the IPR. Institute of Pacific Relations to build a trading block that would come out after wars, mind you. And they'd have that block there. They'd have a European block, a North American block. So it was a big, big player in all of this. But he also went ahead with all the other problems that they had for their future world, which is just around the corner right now. In the scientific outlook, Russell says this on page 221. I come now to a matter which touches the individual more intimately. I mean the question of propagation. Has there been considered that any man and woman not within the prohibited degrees have a right to marry, and having married have a right, if not a duty, to have as many children as nature may decree? This is a right which the scientific society of the future, he was talking about his own one, is not likely to tolerate in any given state of industrial and agricultural technique. You could understand the word technique, what they're talking about here. There's an optimum density of population which ensures a greater degree of material well-being that would result from either an increase or diminution of numbers. As a general rule, except in new countries, the density of population has been beyond this optimum 
though perhaps France in recent decades has been an exemption. Except where there is property to be inherited, the member of a small family suffers almost as much from overpopulation as a member of a large family. Those who cause overpopulation are therefore doing an injury not only to their own children but to the community. That's exactly the technique that is used in China that is to be the model state for the world, according to the UN and all these boys. It may therefore be assumed that society will discourage them if necessary as soon as religious prejudices no longer stand in the way of such action. See, they had to destroy religion, and Galton Darwin said the same thing. said religion's okay as long as there's no God in it. Interesting. Eh? Then he goes on to talk about the different nations and how they would do it in, in the different countries. He even talks about the techniques to bring down liberty in countries meaning to bring in totalitarianism to enforce all of this. And then you jump into his counterpart, and they all knew each other since they all belonged to the same group, as I've mentioned so many times before, The Next Million Years by Charles Galton Darwin. And he says on page 185, he says here, in connection with the recent wonderful advances in medical science, this is the place to mention a matter that will very soon indeed be of immediate importance Since in the normal condition of the world, there will be a margin of every population on the verge of starvation, it seems likely that there will have to be a revision of the doctrine of the sanctity of the individual human life. You see, these guys all wrote about the same things at the same time, and that's what they call putting on a united front to the public. And the public gets dozed with all these boots coming out from all these important people at the same time, just like today. And that's how you get your opinions formed for you. You're being conditioned. Conditioned into that which is to come. That which is to come. And how else would they, would they do it? What else would they use to make it all happen? And if you go keep on in Charles Galton, Darwin's book from the 1950s, this is after World War II. This is after they had genocide and all the rest of it in World War II and the massive slaughters. Here he is pushing eugenics, of course, throughout the whole book. He's talking about creeds. Now, creeds are belief systems. Now, here they are. They have to remove God and all the rest of it from religion. And that's, why, why, that's really why they're hammering the Middle East right now. This is a war on Islam, believe it or not. This is a war on Islam they must remove God from everything so they can re- replace it with their own doctrine. It can be no gods before them. That's their motto. You see? And let's say this little saying from Bertrand Russell. He says, there's no nonsense so arrant, that means ridiculous, that it cannot be made the creed, the belief of the vast majority by adequate government action. And here's his pal here, Charles Galton Darwin, writing this. He said, he's talking about creeds. He says, though the majority of the population say something like nine-tenths accept their creed implicitly and regard it as part of the law of nature, there will always be a small minority who do not. Most people call them sheep, who follow the ideas of the leaders unquestioningly, but then this minority, the goats, a goat, you see, is a real wild sheep. He's not been domesticated. goes by contraries and disbelieves everything just because those around him believe it. Then going down the book, he says, because he's talking about sustainable development. <clears throat> in future history, the constancy of human nature makes it certain that man will continue to be dominated by enthusiasm for beliefs of one kind or another. He will persecute, be persecuted again and again for the sake of ideas, some of which later ages will seem of no importance and even unintelligible. But there is one much more viable aspect of creeds that must be noticed. They serve to guide a to give a continuity to policy, to policy, remember, far greater than can be usually attained by intellectual conviction. In other words, he's talking about the using a creed, creating a creed, a belief system that would last for generations because simply persuasion by itself could only last about one generation. And I'm talking here about what you hear today of the greening movement because that's what they planned to bring in. It would be taught in schools. It would be, have all 
the aspects and attributes of a religion. And it should last for generations. Sustainability. It ties in the eradication and sterilization, etc., of whole populations, which he mentions in his book, the one I'm reading from, The Next Million Years. Quite the boast, eh? So repeat that. There's one much more valuable aspect of creeds that must be noticed. They serve to give a continuity to policy. Whose policy? Their policy. Far greater than can usually be attained by intellectual conviction. There are many cases in the history of enlightened statesmen who have devoted their lives to carrying through some measures for the general good. They may have succeeded only to find that the next generation neglects all they have done so that it becomes undone again in favor of some other quite different way of benefiting humanity. You understand their doublespeak, the tongue from their own points of view in the managed society. So the intellectual adoption of a policy thus often hardly survives for more than a single generation, and this is too short a period for such a policy to overcome the tremendous effects of pure chance. But if the policy can arouse enough enthusiasm to be incorporated in a belief system, then there is at least a prospect that it will continue for something like ten generations. And that's long enough to give a fair probability of success. Back the end of this break. Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and this is Cutting Through the Matrix. Showing you that uh, the events you've lived through in your life were all planned that way. You thought the abortion industry just came out on its own because women were demanding it? No, they were funded by big foundations that trace back to one major foundation in the U.S. and one in Britain. And all the other ones were fronts, well funded, because this is a policy. A policy, not just a sustained uh, development, as they call it, like development as they sustain it. This is to reduce the population into manageable size. It was planned an awful, awful long time ago. I'm reading the next million years again by a big player in this who knew it was already on the go in subversive ways, very stealth mode ways back in his own time. That's when he started uh, to, that's when actually when the sperm count started dropping around the 1950s when he was writing this book. It says here on page 149, it's clear from all this that the world, the world policy, and remember he's making it quite plain because this belongs to the Royal of International Affairs, a world policy, uh, would need to be supported by international sanctions, and the only ultimate sanction must be war. You realize how many people can killed off with wars and it creates famines and all the rest of it too? Present methods of warfare would not be nearly murderous enough to reduce populations seriously. That came out from the King's uh, Inquisition uh, Inquiry or Commission into depopulation right after World War II, which this guy would be at. Would be at he's a tenant. So war is not murderous enough to bring us down, you see, to what they want us to. And even so, they would take a nearly equal toll of victims from the unoffending nation. So after the war, the question would arise of how to reduce the excess population of the offending nation. It's not possible to be humane in this, but the most humane method would seem to be infanticide together with the sterilization of a fraction of the adult population. Such sterilization could now be done without the brutal methods practiced in the past, but it would certainly be vehemently resisted. Of course it would, so they've done it stealthily, you see. These guys are no dummies. And when they read, they, these big world meetings that these guys attend don't make wish lists and hope will all come to their point of view. They go ahead and do it by stealth. He says, I've dwelt on these details, perhaps at unnecessary length, not because I believe it will ever happen, but in order to show that this kind of enforcement, which is the only obvious one, the only obvious one, would lead to a condition of strife, jealousy, and disorder, which is precisely the condition that was designed to avoid. Then he goes in on how to introduce it worldwide, step by step. Who to, whose main enemies would be, talks about the churches, etc., and how they'd have to overcome them, and on and on it goes. It's quite astonishing to realize that these monsters have been running our lives and our parents' lives and grandparents' lives. And it's quickly said in his own book, Tragedy and Hope, and he was all for this group. He was a member of it. He said they've been behind every major war in the 20th century. And I could say they've also been behind the one in the 21st century.
century as well, because it's all according to the mandates they set up an awful long time ago. They've never deviated from the plans they laid down and published like a hundred years ago. Never a deviation. Even their time limits. They're right on time, right on schedule with everything. And that's the bad news. But you don't know your enemy. You can't fight it unless you know who it is. From Hamish myself in Ontario, Canada, it's good night. And may your God or your gods go with you.